Hi, everyone. Welcome to week three. Our theme for this week is language and linguistics, or at least that's part of the theme. There's actually a little bit more to it than that. You notice that the Saucer text talks about linguistics, talks about language, but then we extend sort of beyond that and we get into what Saucer would call semiology. We look at symbols. We look at other forms of communication. So maybe it's not a perfect name, but we'll get more into that in just a second. Before we get to the actual theme for this week, I wanted to return to the question from last week, what is design? And let me start by saying that responses and discussions were fantastic. I really appreciate the thoughtful commentary, the, all the thoughtful discussion content that you posted, some really great ideas. And so you might have disproved my theory. I'm not quite sure right now, but you did an incredible job responding to it. Uh, and, and that discussion was just fantastic. Your responses to the readings were also great for this week. So for everyone who posted those excellent discussion posts, the excellent comments, the excellent re reading responses, Keep doing what you're doing. That's exactly what we hope for. There's a couple that are still missing. Please, if you get those up very, if, if you get them up too late, they're going to get really confused. I don't want to see discussions from from three weeks ago uh, that are about some totally different topic. That's going to throw us off. If you can sneak it in now, like Monday night, before everyone else starts responding to next week, great. Um, and those reading responses are important too. Again, these are a huge piece of your grade. I hope that everybody's got the routine sort of down. If you're having any issues, again, let me know now and please make sure to stay on top of these. It's really important, but everything that's up there is great. So I really wanna focus on the positive. It was really fun reading those responses. I hope everyone else enjoyed reading reading through that discussion and commenting on it. Sometimes I'll comment directly, but I just wanted to sort of see how it was unfolding this week. I also sort of took an assessment and I saw some of the places where it went. It seems like some common themes were, and again, we're returning to this question, what is design? And we're asking the question of whether we can define it. There was a lot about creativity. A lot of people talked about some sort of creative expression. There was a lot about ideas and the way that we put ideas into the world, oftentimes responding to maybe a prompt from a client or something like that, but about putting an idea out there. And that leads to a lot of consideration of communication. And I know that that was a very common theme, talking about visually creating some form of communication. I noticed that as something that was resonating between different, uh, different discussions, different posts. The idea that it's also communicating some kind of information seemed very important to a number of people. So I thought that was a really interesting kind of twist on the response. And I wanna give a special shout out to Angela Sadman and Ikra for the visual responses. That was very cool. Um, again, when we post these discussions, I'm going to encourage some kind of multimedia interaction. If you wanna do a little video to respond or if you wanna create some kind of imagery, excellent, amazing. I really enjoyed those. And across the board, they were really great. So very well done, everyone. I really appreciate that. I think we got a lot of answers for what is design. But, and I just said you might have disproved me. However, I also said, I also asked if you could just sort of put down a couple of very short, succinct sentences to do that. And I don't think anyone did. I don't think I got that really sort of short response that said design is this. Nothing so decisive. So I don't know, maybe you didn't fully disprove my theory. We'll, we'll sort of keep it open for, for debate. But again, it's a theory, so it's something that is more interesting for the debate than for any actual tangible results, I think. And I really appreciate the discussion that formed around that. So 
Very well done, everyone. Keep those discussions going just like that one. Very cool to see. One question that I didn't ask and is the logical extension and the logical lead into this week is what is the relationship between design and language? Again, many of you commented on the ways in which design is related to communication, but we should ask whether communication and language are really the same thing, right? And if we're expressing something visually, is it the same thing as a spoken language? Is it something that's after a spoken language, before that language? Do they mutually coexist? Do they rely on one another? Is one, is one sort of primary and one secondary to the other? There's a lot of questions along these lines that we should be asking ourselves and we should be considering, you know, not just kind of psychologically or sociologically, but I think especially so in the world of design. What is the relationship between the images, the designs, maybe the programs that you create and the ways that we communicate outside of that? And that's the, the idea for today. That's why we want to look at linguistics and language. And that's what brings us to the first reading. So as you know, the text, uh, Course in General Linguistics, was written by Ferdinand de Saussure. Saussure was a Belgian philosopher, theorist, writer of all sorts, professor, and yes, a linguist. Um, <laughs> He, he was actually a, a, a very uh, prominent figure in the field and helped develop all sorts of new ideas in a very sort of early part of, of, of the modern development of linguistics. There are other linguists to follow, notably Charles Sanders Peirce, and even more after that, who developed the field well beyond what Saussure contributed. But I think it's really fun and interesting to read Saussure because he gives us almost a kind of introductory view of where linguistics would go. Some of his ideas are now considered to be outdated, but I think it's very fascinating to see somebody kind of uh, developing these, these ideas in real time. And that's exactly what he's doing. Now you may notice a sort of funny thing happening with these dates on the screen. Ferdinand, Saucer, Ferdinand de Saussure lived from 1857 to 1913. The course in general linguistics was published in 1916. So it was published several years after he passed away. And one of the really fascinating things I think about Saussure's text is that he didn't actually even really write it. Again, he was a professor and he delivered these lectures in his college course. And that course was the course in general linguistics. And he, so he, he gave this series of lectures, just a regular college course. And apparently his students were really great at taking notes. And uh, some of his, his peers, his colleagues, and some of the, some, some linguists who had been his students and then uh, started to excel in the field in their own right, recognized the importance of his work. They went out and collected no his notes and then notes from all his different students over the years. And they were able to sort of reconstruct the course as he taught it. And that's what this, this book is. What we read is a short excerpt from this full book that is called Course in General Linguistics. And it's the collection of his lectures. So, Lucky for me, now we have Zoom and everything I say is just going to be recorded. Maybe somebody will sit down and, and uh, transcribe it if tragedy befalls me, but we'll have some kind of record of it. For Saucer, there was much less of that, but still his ideas remain. And I think that's sort of a testament to how powerful his ideas were. So I want to talk through some of the introductory materials from that text which are before the assigned portion. And then I wanna look at some of the main ideas in the assigned portion, because again, they're very difficult to grasp. And I think it's worthwhile to sort of unpack some of the content that's there. So 
Early on in the text, Saussure states that what is natural to mankind is not oral speech, but the faculty of constructing a language. He sees language as something unique to human beings. It's something that separates us from all the other creatures on the earth. But he actually says the, the idea that we do it in a spoken form is almost sort of accidental. We might have we might have constructed language in any number of different ways, most notably through gestures. And, and you should note that we, we do have forms of language that exist as gestures. Saussure believes that that could have been uh, just as well our primary form of communication. Whatever made us sort of start using our ears and mouths was kind of just uh, a matter of, of convenience or happenstance. We could have just used our eyes and our hands and all the different extensions of those things just as easily. So it's a very interesting concept, but he does recognize that the, the spoken element and the heard element, the, the idea that you use your mouth and your ears is the primary form of language that we did end up adopting. And because this is the primary form that we adopted, he says that there's always two sides to the way that language works. He says that there are first acoustical impressions, meaning sounds hit your ear, right? They, they sort of, they make your ear vibrate. And the, the opposite side to those impressions are the vocal organs, right? You have, you have organs in, in your mouth that create sounds. You have organs in your ear that sort of collect those sounds. He says that they are acoustical vocal, right? So that relationship actually unfolds the next one. The first one that acoustic vocal takes that formula and he says that becomes two-sided as well, that the, the acoustical vocal connects to a physiological psychological relationship. So we have something physiological, something vibrating in our ear or in our throat, and that connects to something psychological. It you know, makes these impressions on our brain, and then we understand it on, on a deeper mental level. So the way that we sort of process that, the way that we use something in our intellect and in, in, in our psyche to make sense of uh, those very physical properties of, of the sound and speech become the next important set of relationships. And then he says that language is individual and social. You must learn the language and you must internalize it. You must think in a certain language, but that language only exists as a means for communicating with everyone else around you. A language is useless if only one person speaks it, right? But we all have our own kind of internal form of it, which is slightly different from the broader social form. So this is another sort of, um, another two-sided, another dichotomy uh, about how language works. And the last thing that he says about language is that there's always or linguistic phenomena really particularly, but he's, he's really talking about language. There's always both an established system and an evolution. We see a lot more of that in, this, in the second chapter that we read. So I'll come back to that when we get to it. So Sarah also starts, again, this is before the, the assigned portion of the reading. He starts by talking about what he calls the speaking circuit. There's always this back and forth relationship. There's always an exchange occurring. Ling linguists since Saussure have called this a transactional form of language, right? I say something and if you were right in front of me in, in the same classroom right now, uh, I would say these things they'd be leaving my mouth and they'd be hitting your eardrum, right? And you might respond and say, hold on, wait, I don't understand that. And then it would be an exchange where you send that back at me, I hear it, and then I'll respond. We're obviously sort of dealing with a one-way street here where, where our 
forms of communication are a little more disjointed, but we can all sort of imagine that situation where we're sitting in a room, we're having a conversation, and there's a constant back and forth. And that sort of flow of ideas from mouth to ear and ear to mouth, always passing through our brain, create something like the flow of electricity. They create a circuit. And that's the idea that Saucer adopts. He gives us another diagram of this circuit. This is, imagine the same two speakers, uh, but seen from above. And here's a more sort of precise visualization of what Saucer says is going on. Audition is hearing the, the thing, like audio audition, and phonation is speaking it, the vocalization of the things. And you see we have this sort of flow, this almost looks like an electrical diagram, right? Where someone phonates, someone speaks, someone vocalizes sounds, and that hits the ears of another person where audition occurs, hearing. Right, an auditory sensation, that person in turn vocalizes something else and the other one hears it. And back and forth, we have a conversation. Language is at work. And he says the two things we're exchanging here are concepts and sound images, which probably sound familiar from the assigned portion. And that leads into the sort of next bit that we'll cover. But before that, he says the circuit can be divided into another sort of set of dichotomies to an outer part and an inner part, right? The outer part is the sort of conversation that anyone eavesdropping in the room would hear. The inner part is the set of concepts circulating in the sort of two minds of the two speakers, right? And again, we have a psychological and a non-psychological. We have those concepts, those ideas in people's minds. And then we also have a very sort of physical thing happening. In order to have a conversation, you're always both active and passive. If you're only active shouting at someone, there's no sort of real exchange of language. You're just shouting, right? And you're, it means your words are sort of falling on deaf ears, right? There will be somebody who is passive at certain times, and they will probably become active again. And any kind of real actual exchange of language depends on, an, on a back and forth between that. Sometimes, you know, right now I'm entirely active. Again, if we were sitting in the same room, I'd be passive for a second and say, do you have any questions? And then you could speak to me and we would go back and forth. But, you know, right now I'm just being active and you're probably sitting back. But even then, your mind is sort of firing and you're probably asking yourselves questions and there is a level of activity even if you can't speak back to me right and the the other way to look at this is to say that there's an executive and a receptive form so executive means i'm executing new sounds i'm sending those your way and you receive them you're being receptive right and Again, to have an exchange of language, you'll be doing both of those things all the time. Returning to this idea about how we exchange language, Saucer says language is a convention and the nature of the sign that is agreed upon does not matter. So again, it could be sound, it could be gesture, it could take all sorts of different forms. And really, it actually doesn't matter. And that's a, a strange thing about the way Saucer thinks about this. There's almost like no importance to the words we use and the way we do it, as long as it, it achieves these exchanges that he's thinking about. So again, this is where we kind of, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get deeper into that in, in one second. But Saucer also makes an important contribution. This is the last thing before we get to the section that's assigned. And this is actually a really important point about, uh, about his work. He's looking at language. He recognizes that although it's a convention, there's no need to necessarily use words other than gestures, but that's what it is. And that's the form that language takes. It's a very specific thing when you look at linguistics you're looking at this real-time exchange between 
two different people speaking. There are far more ways to communicate than that, right? Especially when all sorts of technologies facilitate all sorts of different types of communication, right? We can, we can write a letter to somebody and put it in the mail, right? Or we can record a lecture that uses some of the linguistic properties, but you might write down your response and we might look at this in a, in a way that is a little bit more mediated. Or I can also communicate to you with, with gestures or with symbols, right? So Sarah believes that those things start to extend beyond language, but he, he also believes they're very important. So he sees that signs are both a piece of language and something outside of language. And he wants to account for that. So he says a science that studies the life of signs within society is conceivable. It would be part of social, social psychology and consequently of general psychology. So it's bigger than just linguistics. Looking at what signs do goes beyond, and again, more on signs in just a second, but this is something that goes beyond just the basics of language. Signs are in places where we don't have the same type of language that we use every day. And that study of signs, so Sarah proposes, should be called semiology. Now, there actually is today a field of studies called semiology, and there's another sort of field that developed out of that called semiotics. But both semiology and semiotics are born from this idea that Saucer proposes. And I think that that's a really important contribution that he made, and that's something that we should recognize as an addition to his ideas about language and an extension about, from his ideas about language. And it's another reason why I think this text is, is a really important one for, for us to understand as people who use visual signs to communicate something. And so he, he, he finishes that by saying, semiology would show what constitutes signs and what laws govern. And again, that brings us to some of the concepts about signs that he talks about. These are the images for what Saucer uses as the springboard to talk about signs, right? And I think it's really important to spend some time to clarify exactly what he's talking about. Because although these images are in the text, you see them right there on the printed page, it's kind of like not at all what Saucer means when he's talking about signs. So I wanted to make sure we're on the same page with this and wanted to make sure that it's clear what exactly Saucer is talking about. He says, and we, you know, we're gonna look at this picture of a tree and he's using the French term here, arbor. We could just as easily have the word tree written underneath this picture of the tree. So Sarah says, the linguistic sign unites not a thing and a name, but a concept and a sound image. Okay, so when we talk about that thing, right, we can imagine a tree being a thing. Trees are, by definition, things, right? But when I say the word tree, I'm not talking about the tree that's right outside your window. I'm not talking about a tree in Central Park. I'm not talking about any specific tree. I'm talking about a concept, right? And if I just say tree with nothing else associated with it, with no other sort of context, one person who hears that thinks of a pine tree and another person thinks of an oak tree and another one thinks of a cherry blossom tree, right? There's all sorts of different trees we can be thinking about. And I'm not talking about anything specific though. I'm not talking about the name for a particular thing. I'm talking about a concept. I'm talking about a general idea of tree. And this is the basic building block. And, and, and even then, I'm not talking about the general idea of tree. I'm talking about the general idea of wooden thing that grows out of the ground and has branches on it, right? You can see it's actually a little difficult to talk about these concepts because we need to go back to a place where there's no words or try to imagine before there's words, these things start to take shape, right? So this concept of wooden thing growing out of the ground with branches on it, 
is somehow tied to this sound that escapes my mouth, tree, right? And we're not talking about four letters. Uh, we're talking about a very specific acoustical impression or a phonation, tree, right? We start to think about the four letters and we start to think about the way that it's transcribed. And that's actually something different. Once we write it, it's merely a way, according to Saucer, of recording the sound tree. So this tree is sound image, right? You hear a sound escaping my mouth and it, it sort of creates an impression on you when you hear it. You hear tree, and the first thing that happens is the sound hits your ear. That's the sound image. Once that hits your ear, then it becomes then it becomes psychological, right? And it evokes a certain concept. You start thinking about wooden thing that grows from the ground. And that concept is connected to the sound. According to Saucere, this is a sign. This is a linguistic sign. And when he talks about this, he wants to make this clear. He says that other thinkers who have considered this notion of a sign have, have had a hard time designating those two sides of it, the concept and the sound image. So he wants to have a better way to do that. And he says he'll pro he, he proposes to retain the word sign to talk about the whole collective relationship between this idea of the wooden thing that grows from the ground and the sound. And he'll replace the concept, the idea, with signified. And he'll replace that sound of it with the signifier. So we say, and, and this is important to, to note, because when we look at this book, we think, oh, the picture is the, the concept and the, and the word is the sound image. The picture is the signified, the word is the signifier. No, not according to Saucer. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying this idea that exists in your mind is the signified. And the word, the sound that escapes your lips to describe that thing is the signifier. And the fact that those two create a relationship in our mind, the, the fact that the signifier can automatically evoke the signified creates in our own mind a sign. Okay. It's really, I, I hope that I've explained that well. It's a complex set of ideas and it, it's kind of one step removed from how we might normally think about language, but this is what Saucer is trying to get at. Now, there's a few principles that follow from this. And again, this is um, going right back to the texts that we read, and I hope that this helps to sort of clarify what he's talking about. The first principle that Saucer raises when, when we think about this sign is that it is arbitrary, that all signs uh, have at their core an arbitrary nature. There's absolutely no reason in the world why this sound tree evokes the wooden thing that grows out of the ground. We could just as well call that thing light bulb or dog, right? And if everybody agreed that wooden thing growing out of the ground was, was signified by the sound dog, then it would work just as well, right? It, it's no more logical to call it tree than it is to call it anything else. And it's actually completely arbitrary. Nobody ever sat down and decided that wooden thing growing out of the ground should be called tree. And in fact, if you're in Belgium, it's called arbor, right? Or if you're in France, or if you're anywhere else in the world, it's called something different, right? And that, and, and no one term is better than the other. Tree is not any more accurate than arbor or any less accurate. There's really no reason why it should be one thing instead of another. It's fully arbitrary. It just started to be used. He, he makes some exceptions. He tries to account for some ideas about how maybe there's something connected uh, uh, with, with the original sound of it. And he but he says that those are all just kind of exceptions. It's really not why we, why we use those words. In effect, it's totally arbitrary. We just happened to stumble upon that word. 
some person pointed at it and grunted and that grunt some, some you know one day evolved into being tree and fine that's great as long as we all know that tree signifies this one this this concept then it's just as good as any other one right so it's totally arbitrary the second principle that Saucer believes is important for understanding the sign is that the signifiers are linear, right? We don't just say tree and point. We say, we say something like, there's a tree growing outside my window. There's a branch falling off that tree. Look at the bird in the tree. Every one of these formulations connects different signifiers and it moves directly in time or space, right? It creates a line. It creates a complete thought. Signifiers do not exist in a jumble, according to Saucer. I could drop the words bird, tree, branch, the, is, now onto a blank sheet of paper, and it doesn't create a, a unified thought. All those signifiers must be linear. They must either exist in time as I complete a sentence speaking to you, or they can be transcribed in space all in a single order to create that same thought. But they must exist in a line. Otherwise we don't have language. We just have a couple of sort of vocabulary words floating around and it's not very useful for communicating to one another. So this is the second principle that so Sarah believes is very important for understanding uh, the signifier and ultimately the sign. Okay, this is how he lays out the framework for the signifier, signified, and sign. He then moves on to talk about ways in which the sign changes or doesn't change over time. He calls this the immutability and mutability of the sign. Immutable means that it cannot change. Mutable says that it can change. So it's this funny kind of, again, it might seem like a contradiction. Maybe it's just another dichotomy, but he says that signs are both immutable, they cannot be changed, and they're mutable. They can be changed, they're always changing. And he gives a number of reasons for each, each uh, side of this equation. He says signs are immutable, first of all, because they're arbitrary, right? No one decided that tree should be called tree. And if suddenly today I decide that it should be called light bulb or dog or whatever else, it doesn't matter that I decided that. I can, you know, if, if you know, the president of the United States or if, I don't know, some high up ruler or if, Mayor Adams, I don't know, decides tomorrow that tree is going to be dog and makes a big announcement, you know, and stands at a podium and says from henceforth tree is dog. It's absurd. <laughs> you know, nobody can change that because it's arbitrary. Nobody decided it in the first place and no one can suddenly decide to change it, right? And it's, it's more complex than that, but, you know, we, we never sort of decide these things. They just happen to be what they are, and so they stay what they are. And there's so many signs that there's a multiplicity of signs necessary to create language. And that's the second reason why it becomes impossible, right? Well, if we start calling tree dog, what are we going to call the furry thing walking around the ground? And we'll have to give that another name and then keep changing all the names. And there's so many different words, so many different signs to describe everything in the world that there's no way we can possibly sort of assign the correct sign to everything else. We, can know, we, can, we can't have the right word. And uh, again, our, our sort of linguistic exchanges will become completely impossible because there's so many things that we have to learn and they're going to be all jumbled up, right? which also points to the fact that the system is overly complicated. It's especially true with English. There are so many different modifiers, so many different forms, so many different terms, and we don't even get to spelling, you know, to understanding like how to sort of um, even write those down. We're not even there yet. We're just looking at all the conventions of how we speak. It's so complicated 
that no one's able to just sit down and say, let's do it this different way. Well, we already have the way we do it. It's extremely complicated. It's not really easy to do, but that's just where it is. And it's going to stay there because it's too complicated to rewrite it. And then that fi the final piece that he outlines uh, in terms of the immutability of the sign, it's unchangingness, is that there's a collective inertia. We all communicate the way we communicate. We all employ language in the way we use it. Trying to get somebody to just suddenly change how they speak is nearly impossible. And, and trying to get everyone to simultaneously change would never happen. We, we're moving along in our lives We've got better things to do than rewrite the way that our language works. So there's an inertia. We just keep going with the language that we have. And it's fine because it mostly serves the purposes that we need it to serve. Okay? So this is why the sign is immutable, unchanging. But again, the sign is also mutable. The sign does change, right? And this is kind of uh, the, the, the counter argument. He presents both of these. And... They're not even arguments against one another. They're, there are two sides to the same thing. We know that language does change, right? Sometimes it happens slowly. You, you know, we, we no longer speak like Shakespeare when we use the English language, right? This is a slow evolution from things like thou hast not, right? Like, it becomes, it slowly changes over time and we take different shape. It also can change relatively quickly. If I say, you know, have you Googled the fact that Facebook is changing to meta? That's a sentence that was complete gibberish to somebody 20 years ago, right? And now it's something that is actually very easy for us to understand because these are all sort of new uh, signs that are entering into our language system, right? So the language does change. Sometimes it comes about um, because of technology, sometimes from slang, there's all sorts of reasons. And so Sarah outlines a few of them. He says that there can be a shift in the relationship between signifier and signify. This can happen in a number of ways. It's partially from, from usage, it's partially from developments in society. It's always connected to how we sort of understand uh, the way that signs work. Something like tree is probably not going to change that much. That relationship stays pretty fixed. Whereas something like, you know, the word car, there's a constantly shifting relationship between that signifier and signified because of technological developments, right? A car to you is different from a car to your grandparents, and it's different from somebody in Saucer's day in you know, 1913 driving around in a Ford Model T, right? That car has uh, that idea, that concept of the car, the signified, has shifted over time. Right. The same thing with with computer is another sort of technological example. Right. The sort of the whatever small device you may be looking at right now is very different from the giant room full of IBM tape machines that they used in the, in the 1950s or 60s. Right. So that's one or a couple of technological examples for how the relationship between signifier and signified has changed. It could also, um, you know, it, it can also change because of slang terms. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go back to, to our dogs that we have floating around. I'm not sure why that's on my mind, but you know, what's up dog is, uh, is a shift in the signifier and signify, right? The dog in that sentence, you know, now signifies friend. Right, so there's a changed relationship, or maybe it took like 20 years ago. I don't know if that's a corny example, but um, that's different from the furry four-legged creature, right? And it, it shows a shift in the signifier and signify. So Sarah also says that language is radically powerless to defend itself. There's no central authority that decides how language works. 
and you know an English teacher in in the 1960s or probably even the 1990s would um, would be appalled if I walked into the room and said what's up dog but that English teacher is not the uh, is not some part of some central authority that decides what language does right so despite some people who like to adhere to uh, certain forms of language there's nothing that the language can do as people start speaking in different ways the language will meld it will will adjust itself to the way that people are speaking and will all sort of adapt to new forms of linguistic exchanges that's one way that language always changes and that's related to the third way in which Saucer says that uh, the sign is mutable because when when the sign, when language become the property of everyone, control is lost. Again, it goes along with this collective inertia. Even though you know the founders of a company decided that a search engine would be called Google, they no longer control the way that that word circulates in our language, right? It, the word, you know, the signs, the, the signifiers and signifieds, the words that we use, to identify things, just go into a flow of our common everyday usage and no one can control where they go. The meaning of, of those words, of those signs will change over time. And then one of the last things we see in the selection uh, that we've read for this week is this diagram and I, I'm sorry that all these diagrams are a little fuzzy. They're really like blown up from scans of the text. So they're, they're a little grainy, but this is to illustrate the notion that we have language and it's connected to the community of speakers, everyone using it. Everyone using it has a piece of the language and here it is connected. And then it does change over time. And that language is connected and then over time, we see an evolution, we see a development, and that language and that community are always tied together, but always part of this evolution. So these are some of the basic concepts. I hope, especially if it was a little sort of hazy, I hope what I've just went over helps to describe what's in Saucere. I hope it helps to clarify. Again, if you have any additional questions, please put them in as a, as a comments on this post be happy to look at any uh, any sort of anything else that needs clarification please include it here uh, i think it's important to at least wrap our heads around this on some level and again i hope that that clarifies i'm going to switch gears now to the second readings and to hit a couple of key points from them but I'll do it by way of, of a rewind, even back before some of the ancient ideas that Ellen Lupton and Abbott Miller talk about. And I'll go all the way back to some of the first images that humanity created. These are cave paintings. These are, uh, this one in particular is from the caves at Lascaux. They're 17,000 years old. I think it's really interesting to think about these after we've considered Saucer and we've seen this text uh, where we, we see a picture of a horse and he talks about the sign and he talks about this relationship between a concept and a sound image. We have no idea what the relationship between the concept of a horse and the sound image that might have signified it in 17,000 years ago, what that might have been. We don't know what the word would have been. We don't know if there was a word connected to the images that we see in these caves. We don't know if these images were ever intended to, to represent a single word or a set of words. We know that they're tied to some reality, but we really have no idea how they connect to any kind of language system or to any kind of semiological system. There's all sorts of theories here. This one might be a little tough to see, but uh, very similar images on the tops of the caves. There's a theory that they are representative of the constellations 
outside the caves. There's theories that they could represent the motion or the growth of different animals over time. We don't know. There, there's a lot of speculation and not much information to go by. There's certainly no written record for what the sound images might have been that could have been associated with these, uh, with these pictures, with these representations, with these graphic compositions. And the mystery of them is, is, is also what makes them so fascinating for so many people and, and such powerful images, I believe. Um, these ones going back even further, 35,000 years uh, before the present. It becomes even more complicated when you think about images like this, which we found in caves, where um, we see a mark that is not drawn by hand, but is the exact impression of somebody having been there. Certainly, we can't sort of identify these names by hand, by, by the hand, right? We can't, you know, we could take all of our handprints and you never know whose was whose. You'd have maybe some inclination, but you would never look at one hand and say, oh, that's Matt. Yeah, hey, Matt, right? It's not connected to, even if they are connected to some lived reality, which they are, they show us who was there, but they're, they're not connected directly to any kind of linguistic system. So the question emerges, what relationship is there between graphic systems, graphic representations, and linguistic systems? Are the pictures we create always tied to our language? Are they tied to the way we communicate verbally? Or are we communicating on a different level? Can we say the same thing with a picture that we say with words? What is the relationship between those things? Again, it's a complex question, maybe a complex set of questions, but I think an interesting one. And it leads us back to what Ellen Lupton and Abbott Miller are addressing in these couple of selections from a book called Design Writing Research. This is a book, maybe you can see it a little bit in, in, in the window. It's a book co-authored by Ellen Lupton and Abbott Miller. Um, and they're actually partners, um, they're, they're, uh, they're married. Uh, and they're both, uh, both excellent designers and excellent writers, excellent instructors in their own right too. But this is a book co-authored in 1996, if I've got the date right, which compiles different essays that they wrote uh, around that time. The first one that we saw is called Counting Sheep. And it's talking about graphic representations that might not be directly connected to life. Right? They say in this text, most definitions of writing are a representation of speech capable of being read back orally as a series of words, one after the other. They also say that writing is assumed to be graphic, consisting of lines drawn on a flat plane, right? Just sort of like writing on a sheet of paper. And then they go on to give us all these examples that complicate that and sort of disprove both of these ideas, right? One of those examples uh, can be seen in this Ashango counting stick, right? We can see hash marks for different numbers, right? We're counting something. But again, this does not read as, you know, Joey down the street borrowed 20 sheep from me today. Right? It's a representation of certain ideas and it's a graphical representation, but it's not writing in the way that we think, you know, a typical book word after word in a linear form is writing. Or another example that they raise are, are, are different forms of currency, like the Sumerian token envelope. right? Each of the sort of small pieces that you see displayed in front of this ball are, are representative of quantities of money, right? They, uh, they depict, and you, you could probably relate them to dollar or, or peso or the Sumerian word for money. And then even the envelope itself, this three-dimensional object is representative of an exchange 
that could more or less be stated in words, but it's not quite the same thing as a written sentence, right? Or an abacus, right? The way that we count using beads. And, and again, we could write out 1,231 on, on, this, uh, on this device and many of us would be able to read it and it would actually transcend languages, right? It's something that I say that in English, you might understand the same concept, the same number in a completely different language. So what do all these things say about how we represent things graphically? They might say that they're not actually directly connected to language, right? That the graphic representation of something is somehow related to the language we use, but not equivalent. And if you said that, you'd probably be agreeing with Ellen Lupton and Abbott Miller. So those are a few ideas from that first essay. The second essay, is called modern hieroglyphs. And we're probably familiar with the term of hieroglyph, right? We've, we've seen this kind of, um, we've heard the word used. It, it actually means sacred writing. This hiero is the same as hierarchy, if you hear that word, and it, it refers to sacred writing. And we typically think of it as an enigmatic or incomprehensible symbols or writings, right? And of course, ancient Egyptians are exactly where our mind goes, but that's not what Ellen Lupton and Abbott Miller are talking about. They go back to Otto Neurath and the isotype system that Neurath devised. And this is a method which became hugely influential and we see different forms of it in use all over the place today, but it's a method of representing the world graphically instead of verbally. And again, this becomes really important when we're in places like an airport bathroom where we might not speak the language, but we know where to go because of pictures on the wall, right? There were many uses and there continue to be many uses for isotype and its derivatives representing uh, different sports and different activities can be one of them. They were used to uh, to different degrees uh, to, to visualize demographic studies, you can see why this is problematic. And we should immediately understand that this study of demographics can immediately slip into stereotypes that are at, at best uh, just that stereotypes and at, our, at worst are downright racist. And this is a problem with the way that we can represent things, right? Um, we should recognize immediately that this is, uh, that this can descend very quickly into a set of assumptions that are imperialistic, colonialistic, short-sighted, problematic on so many different levels, right? And this is a very extreme example. I think it happens with these images on all sorts of different levels. And a very simple one is just, you know, on the bathroom door, right? The notion that some people wear pants and other people uh, do not is, is a cultural assumption, right? Um, and this is what can happen with these representations. And again, I'm, I'm showing you this because I, I think we, we should take stock of it. We should pause to reflect on where this can go if not considered properly. It can also be, it can also have sort of uh, very powerful effects. This is actually one from, you know, uh, in the early 20th century, a direct result of Otto Neurath's uh, use of isotype, talking about the spread of tuberculosis. And it probably looks really familiar, right? We see similar diagrams, similar charts in the age of COVID, that talk about how diseases spread. And again, it can be a very powerful and effective way to communicate a message across language groups, a message that might somehow transcend language. But again, this idea of hieroglyphs is rooted in, uh, you know, it's rooted in terminology that was devised to think about Egyptian writing. And that probably has its own set of assumptions that go with it. And 
I think it can be sort of fun to take on another different way and you know, to understand how this is problematic. And I have this illustration for you. If we look at some of the Egyptian writing that you know, Westerners started calling hieroglyphs, we can take a set of images like this one, right? And this says something very specific and something that would be very clear to the priests or the scribes who, who were fluent in the use of, of what we refer to as hieroglyphs. And I think it's sort of fun to look at this and to wonder what this says. Now, thanks to uh, different archeological research, primarily the, the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, we have some sense of what this said. And we now know that if we were to translate it into English, these images say something along the lines of, evolutions. Where that relationship comes about is, uh, you know, we, we might recognize certain symbols like the scarab can, can mean something of an evolution, but it's certainly an abstraction, right? Or another one we can look at quickly, uh, try to imagine what this means, and you might be surprised to know that it is, I came forth. Right, so you, you, you see this this connection between the the writing system and the signifier signified can can be slippery one, and it can it can uh, raise some interesting questions. Another example that's more modern, which can show you some of the assumptions that we bring with us. This is cat, right, or tiger, or or jungle cat. But we all know that it's not. We all see this and we say sneaker company, right? So the notion is that these images, we think they have a direct connection to reality, but maybe not so much. Maybe they're a little bit less attached than we might assume. And that leads to these different terms uh, that Ellen Lupton and Abbott Miller outline in the language of dreams. You should have gathered some of this, but just as a very brief review. Hieroglyph doesn't really sum up what we do with graphical representations of language. They offer these other terms instead. A pictograph doesn't refer to a word in a particular language, but to a physical object in the world. Okay. An ideograph is a situation in which pictures stand for a concept or idea rather than a material object. So really those things that we call hieroglyphs, when in use, they're really more ideographs, right? Those are about uh, ideas or concepts. A rebus, is, it, it, a rebus exchanges literal meaning of images for indirect substitutions. You remember the Johnny Carson example, this is a rebus. A syllabary uses a set of symbols representing all of the consonant vowel pairs in a language. So you create all the different possible sounds. You'd have a symbol for ko and a symbol for ka and a symbol for do and a symbol for da. And each of those symbols would be put to use. And you can see this is leading towards another form of graphical representation of language, which is the alphabet. The alphabet abstracts sounds of spoken language separate with separate symbols for vowels and consonants. And obviously this is what we use for, for the English language um, and for most European language systems. It doesn't mean it's the best way. It's just one form in which we can graphically represent languages and we use it for what it is. So again, these are the, the terms outlined in that last text. Again, I think it's important to consider how these are directly or indirectly related to the use of language. It's important to recognize that graphical representation is not quite the same as, as, as a language in use. And it's important to question how we use those things together. Okay. The last thing. I'm going to exit the slideshow, stop screen sharing. 
the discussion part for today is a little bit of a twist. I'm including a link in that discussion post to a page with all of the Super Bowl ads listed, just in order in which they appear. The discussion point, maybe you saw some of them, maybe you saw them on social media, maybe you saw them during the game. Pick one of them, locate one of those ads, and maybe one comes to mind. Maybe you were you know, reading, saw Sarah in one room where you, well, your family was watching the Super Bowl and another, and ideas were sort of flowing. Um, Maybe you watched the Super Bowl right after you read Saucera and you said, hey, like the use of language is really interesting in that one. Pick one ad that uses language or graphic symbols. I think the graphic symbols are a little bit less prominent. You might not find as many sort of direct connections um, to the Ellen Lupton and Abbott Miller readings. But if you do, amazing. I think there actually were some where the graphics are important. Pick, pick one of those ads, briefly describe how it uses language or graphic symbols in an interesting way. Just recognize, you don't have to sort of fully understand what it's doing, but just make note of the language and what the language does or does not do. Maybe it's the lack of language, the lack of a particular use of language that makes it an interesting ad. But I think the language is really important and it plays out on different levels. So pick one of those ads, talk about why the language is important or interesting and present that as your discussion post. Again, it can be very brief, just a couple of sentences talking about what made it interesting, um, describe the ad or link back to it and then comment on at least three other discussion posts. Okay, so that's going to be the discussion portion for today. I think it's going to be really interesting. So there's some fun ads out there. There are some bad ones too. That's always the case. But I'm looking forward to seeing where this discussion goes. The assignment for next week is a few uh, manifestos from from art movements in the early 20th century. So it'll be very different and it's going back to ideas about design written by designers. So I think that's gonna be a fun reading too. Again, look at that checklist. Let me know if you have any questions and looking forward to seeing another great round of posts for your discussion and for those responses. Thanks.